DNA identification has become an indispensable and a routine part of the forensic investigations. If adequate amount of DNA are recovered from a crime scene, the analysis of forensic DNA is relatively straightforward. However, difficulty arise when only badly decomposed or highly degraded human skeletal remains are found. In such cases, only trace amounts of the low quality DNA might be recovered. And this can be problematic when using regular forensic DNA techniques. For instance, you may not be able to recover enough DNA for analysis, or your analytical methods may not be sensitive enough to give you a reliable DNA profile, and your lab facility may not be well equipped to deal with such trace amount of DNA and in the end you may analyze or obtain contaminated DNA. Contaminated DNA results are wrong, and they will lead to misidentifications. We have a, a forensic case that hasn't been resolved for more than 25 or, or 50 years. The DNA in those forensic remains, usually their skeletonized human remains, is very degraded. The protocols that are traditionally used in forensic DNA may not be sensitive enough to effectively extract and analyze the DNA in an individual who's been dead for 50 years. Cold cases use a more sensitive protocol, more like the one that would be used in ancient DNA analysis to get at that very degraded DNA. The logic is very simple. If you can successfully recover and analyze DNA from ancient human remains that are 3,000 years old, it should not be too difficult for you to generate DNA identifications of forensic human remains that are only 30 years old. One of the challenges with forensic DNA is that although it is a very powerful tool and it, it can give you a high degree of accuracy, you have to have a reference sample with which to compare it to. Say, for instance, we find a skeletonized individual and we want to know who they are. Even if we're able to get a great uh, DNA profile, if we don't have a presumed missing person to match it to, then that DNA profile on its own can't really help us. So it's, it's only a very powerful tool if we have a reference to compare it to. I'm a botanist by training, but my first real love was plant ecology. Then secondly, I moved into plant fossils. Fossils are incomplete, often fragmentary. And they're not the whole plant. And that is often what you deal with in a forensic investigation. Some seeds on a shoe or fragmentary leaves uh, associated with a crime scene. So it was a natural transition to go from my plant ecology and fossil work into forensic botany usually brought in part way through a police investigation where the police will have collected some plant materials in association with a crime and send it to me for analysis. Or sometimes I'm actually called in early in a stage to collect materials at a crime scene. Forensic botany is, as you might expect, the use of plants and plant parts like pollen grains and seeds and wood in the investigation of forensic cases, criminal cases, or other kinds of legal questions or disputes that scientists might approach in some way, but plants are the key. Palynology is a subdiscipline of botany, but it's the study of microscopic pollen grains, spores, and other small microscopic organic plant fragments, including some algae and, and other things. So forensic palynology means using these microscopic plant bits, pollen and spores primarily, in the investigation of crimes or other legal questions. Contamination is a big issue, and one of the questions in forensic botany, particularly with microscopic things like pollen, is you know, how do you know that some of the pollen you collected from your soil sample wasn't blown in from your air in your laboratory? And, and here you just have to be extremely careful that, for example, when I work on a forensic case, I only use brand new glassware, I wash it all with distilled water, so it's been filtered, there's no pollen in the water. I do it in a fume hood where there's an airflow where pollen can't settle out into my samples. So you have to do what you can 
to minimize the chances of contamination, but you know, I have no control over how the sample was collected and how it was stored by the police before it even came to me. So it's always an issue, and I think it tends to come up of, you know, how sure are you that these samples haven't been contaminated in some way. So it's a very important thing, particularly when it comes time to go to court. The overall objective when you're using stabilised topes to regionalise someone in their lifetime is to try and put together two different places. If we just take the most simple possibility that somebody has moved from one area and is now living in another and they died in, in that second place. The key thing to try and do is to match the data that we have extracted from their childhood signature in their skeleton to an area, a region or a geographic locale. And then you would have a second task of matching the information that has gone into forming their tissues in this second area, the area they died in. And it's the same trick. You're trying to match the environmental data to the biological data that you've got from the skeleton. Once we're born and our mothers are not building our tissues for us, we start to replace and build our tissues from our environment. Everything comes from our environment and people live in different environments around the world. If you've lived in Vancouver your whole life, uh, in one area of Vancouver, then Everything from your environment, what you eat, what you breathe in, what you touch, is all going towards building your tissues. And some of those things you don't want in your tissues, like pollutants. But our bodies are like sponges. We take everything in and we use a great deal of it. And we build our tissues. And some of those tissues are very transient, like blood. Blood is changing all the time. But in the skeleton, in our bones, that can be there for 15 years. Uh, our teeth can store that information for decades. Teeth are a huge storehouse of uh, biological and environmental and life history information. We have two sets, so our first set is forming even before we're born, and so there's a temporal component, a sort of age component in the teeth. And those two sets of teeth, from a forensic point of view, can help you age how old that child is. And that's a key question in forensics. How old is this person? So that's just looking at the tooth itself. If you look inside the tooth, there's even more information. Uh, one of the most important developments over the past 15 years is the ability to recover DNA from teeth. And teeth are a good, safe place to look for it, and DNA is often extracted from inside the pulp cavity of the tooth, so that's the hollow internal part of the tooth. And there are a lot of residues of cell nuclei in there that can be recovered. And then the isotopic data that you can get from teeth, again, that takes us back to life history, what we're doing in our lifetime. The enamel itself is giving you information which is layered information because we, it forms in layers. And we're getting to the point where we can look at this temporal information, these, these time capsules, in a lot more detail than we've been able to do.